Bing bong, bong, bing bong, bong. This is Joe, the bearded historian. He'll tell you an interesting history. Be careful of his soldiers. They can be brats. This is Angel. She's an entity. She'll cause his us and clap her hands at you. This is Sue. She likes spirits, not the alcohol. She's the reason this channel exists. This is David. He likes fire trucks. He's here occasionally. Bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong. We preserve his story. Way back Wednesday. Almost Father's Day. Hey, Father's Father's Day. We're trying to work out an idea for Father's Day. There may be a video including Joe's father. If we can talk him into it. So, fingers crossed. Um, but before that, Joe was feeling a little bit spacey, too, so today's video is space related. So, we've got a space race. You guys ready? Here we go. Shout out time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so I'll support you. This shout out is for our friend. Let's see who it is today. Ooh. And off we go, blasting off. We got She Stole, we got Gypsy, we got Right Touch, Owen, Bait, Goat, Carter, Southern, Cruising, Martin, Amanda, uh, Richard, Lucy, Lower, um, Sylvia, Southern, uh, let's see, Leon, uh, Abundance, Distracted, uh, Ruben, there's Wee Wee, there's Tramps, there's Alice, Laney, Ohio, Jared, uh, Reef, Derek, Stacy, Lynn, Really Haunted, Derek, uh, Woman Outdoors, Contract. <coughs> oh, my eyes are all watery this morning, guys. Let's see if I can make out any of these things. Uh, looks like it's Leon. Okay, so Leon is in Japan, and he has one of those channels with no information. But, we've got some, looks like, uh, food of, and travel vlogs here. We've got some food, um, here. And then here... We've got some hangout, travel-y kind of vlogs here. Um, mostly what I'm pocketing is people chatting. Uh, so if you are into that, check him out. Like, share, comment, and we're good. Yeah. Our bearded historian is in a spacey mood because he's a spacey man. Beep. Well, the list of odds and ends and ends and odds that uh, I was given had, a, had an interesting little uh, tidbit regarding what was known as the Pioneer Ten, and on the, this date, back in 2003, it left our solar system. Bye bye. Yeet. Little uh, background details that they have. Uh, back in the 60s, <clears throat> for those of you who are very old, uh, American aerospace engineer Gary Flandreau of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory (JPL) conceived a mission known as the Planetary Grand Tour. Uh, this would exploit a rare alignment of the outer planets of the solar system. Uh, the mission would ultimately be accomplished in the late 1970s by the two Voyager probes, but in order to prepare for it, NASA decided in 1964 to experiment with launching a pair of probes to the outer solar system. Now, an adequacy group named the Outer Space Panel chaired by American space scientist James A. V Van Allen, worked out the scientific rationale for exploring the outer planets. NASA Goddard Space Flight Center put together a proposal for the galactic Jupiter probes that would pass through the asteroid belt and visit Jupiter. These were to be launched in 1972 and 1973 during favorable windows that occurred only a few weeks every 13 months. Kind of like making the ultimate pool shot. Now, launch uh, during other time intervals would have been more costly in terms of propellant requirements. 
Well, approved by NASA in February of 1969, the twin spacecraft were designed Pioneer F and Pioneer G before launch. Later, they were named Pioneer 10 and 11, respectively. They formed part of the Pioneer program, a series of U.S. uncrewed space missions launched between 1958 and 1978. The model was the first of the series to be designed to explore the outer solar system, and based on proposals issued throughout the 1960s, the early mission objectives was to explore the interplanetary of the smallest medium past the orbit of Mars, study the asteroid belt, and assess possible hazards, uh, traveling through the belt, as well as exploring Jupiter and its environment. Later development stage objectives included a, p- a probe closely approaching Jupiter to provide data on the effect of the environmental radiation surrounding Jupiter would have on spacecraft instruments. Well, more than 150 scientific experiments were proposed for the missions. Let's cram everything we know into one, into one mission. Uh, and then these were finalized. Uh, this would perform imaging and uh, pol- pol- polarity of Jupiter and several of its satellites, making infrared and ultraviolet observations of Jupiter, detecting asteroids and meteoroids, determine the composition of charged particles, and to measure the magnetic fields, plasma, cosmic rays, and zodiacal light. Observation of the spacecraft communications as it passed behind Jupiter would allow measurements of planetary atmosphere while tracking data would improve estimates of the mass of Jupiter and its moons. Well, the NASA Ames Research Center, rather than Goddard, was selected to manage the project as part of the Pioneer Program. The Ames Research Center, under the directions of Charles F. Hall, was chosen because of its previous experience with spin-stabilized spacecraft. The requirements called for a small, lightweight spacecraft, which was magnetically clean and could perform an interplanetary mission. It was to use spacecraft modules that had already been proven in Pioneer's 6 through 9 missions. Ames commissioned a documentary film by George Van Valkenburg titled Jupiter Odyssey. It received numerous international awards and is visible on Van Valkenburg's YouTube channel. Well, in February of 1970, Ames awarded a combined $380 million contract to TRW Inc. for building both the Pioneer vehicles bypassing the usual bidding process to save time. B.J. O'Brien and Herb Lassen led the TRW team that assembled the spacecraft. Design and construction of the spacecraft required an estimated 25 million man-hours. An engineer from TRW quipped, This spacecraft is guaranteed for two years of interplanetary flight. If any components fails without that warranty period, just return the spacecraft to the stop and we will repair it free of charge. Sure, that's possible. (laughs) Let me get you a thread on that. Yeah. Go ahead and send them That's on out there. They should catch up. Return policy yeah. Do. Nobody can do that. Nobody's going to go do that. To meet the schedule, the first launch would need to take place between February 29th and March 17th so that they could arrive at Jupiter in November of 1974. This was later revised to an arrival date of December 1973 in order to avoid conflicts with other missions over the use of the Deep Space Network for communications and missed the period when Earth and Jupiter would be at opposite sides of the Sun. The encounter trajectory for Pioneer 10 was selected to maximize the information returned about the radiation environment around Jupiter, even if this caused damage to some of the systems. It would come within about three miles the radius of the planet, which was thought to be the closest it could approach and still survive the radiation. The trajectory chosen would give the spacecraft a good view of the sunlit side. The design itself, the Pioneer 10 bus, measures 14 inches deep in 30 inches long panels forming a hexagonal structure. The bus houses propellant to control the orientation of the probe and eight of the 11 scientific instruments. The equipment compartment lay with an aluminum honeycomb structure to provide protection from meteoroids. A layer of insulation consisting of aluminized Mylar and Kapton blankets provides passive thermal control. Heat was generated by the dissipation of 70 to 120 watts from the electrical components inside the compartment, and the heat range was maintained within the operating limits of the equipment 
by means of louvers located below the mounting platform. The spacecraft had a launch mass of about 570 pounds. Oh, wow. Now, at launch, the spacecraft carried 79 pounds of liquid hydrazine monopropellant in a 42-centimeter, or 17-inch, diameter spherical tank. Orientation of the spacecraft was maintained with six 4.5N hydrazine thrusters mounted in three pairs. Pair 1 maintained a constant spin rate of 4.8 RPMs. Pair 2 controlled a forward thrust, while Pair 3 controlled the altitude. Or the altitude. Attitude. The attitude pair were used in conical scanning maneuvers to track Earth with its orbit. Orientation information was provided by a star sensor to refer- reference Copernicus and two sun sensors. Now, Pioneer 10 uses four SNAP-19 radioisotope thermoelectric generators. These are positioned on two three-rod trusses, each three meters or 9.8 feet in length and 120 degrees apart. This was expected to be the safe distance from the sensitive scientific instruments carried on board. Combined, the RTGs provided 155 watts at launch and decayed to 140 watts in transit to Jupiter. The spacecraft requires 100 watts to power all systems. The generators are powered by a radioisotope fuel plutonium-238. They did carry it. Mm. Uh, which is housed in a multi-layer capsule protected by a graphite heat shield. Now, the pre-launch requirements for the SNAP-19 was to provide power for two years in space. And this was greatly exceeded during the mission. The plutonium-238 has a half-life of 87.74 years, so that after 29 years, the radiation being generated by the RTGs was at 80% of its intensity at launch. However, steady deterioration of the thermal couple junctions led to a more rapid decay in electrical power generation, and by 2001, the total power output was down to 65 watts. As a result, later, the mission-only selected instruments could be operated at any one time. Now, the space probe included a redundant system of transceivers, one attached to the narrow beam high-gain antenna, the other to the on-beam antenna, and the medium-gain antenna. The parabolic dish for the high-gain antenna is 9 feet in diameter and made of an aluminum honeycomb sandwich material. The spacecraft was spun around an axis that is parallel to the axis of the antenna so it could remain oriented towards the Earth. Each transceiver has an 8-watt one and transmits data across the S-band using 2110 megahertz for the uplink from Earth and 2292 megahertz for the downlink to Earth with a deep space network tracking the signal. Data to be transmitted is passed through the convolutional encoder so that the most communication errors could be corrected by receiving equipment on Earth. The data transmission rate launch was 256 bits per second, with the rate degrading by about 1.27 millibits each day during the mission. Now, much of the computation for the mission was performed on Earth and transmitted to the spacecraft, where it was able to retain memory up to five commands of the 222 possible entries by ground controllers. The spacecraft includes two command decoders and a command distribution unit a very limited form of a processor to direct operations on the spacecraft. This system requires that the mission's operators prepare commands long in advance of transmitting them to the probe. A data storage unit is included to record up to 6,144 bytes of information gathered by the instruments. The digital telemetry unit is used to prepare the collected data in one of the 13 possible formats before transmitting it back to Earth. So again, remember, this was back in the days when, uh, well, nowadays your microwave probably has more computing strength. Yeah, it's like 13 forms. I don't even think I can think of 13 forms that currently have, like, Wave, MPG, G... Uh, I don't, a lot of those didn't uh, exist back then, so I'm just like, uh, what were these 13 magical things that they could send them as? Yeah. Now, the scientific instruments that this, uh, this satellite decided to launch off with uh, the instrument measures the fine structure. This is the helium vector magnetometer. Uh, measures the fine structure of the interplanetary magnetic field, mapping the Jovian magnetic field, and providing 
magnetic field measurements to evaluate the solar wind interaction with Jupiter. The magnetometer consisted of a helium-filled cell mounted on a 6.6 meter boom to partially isolate the instrument from the spacecraft's magnetic field. It's like I'm going to stick this out on a stick. Ooh, hope it doesn't break. Yes. The quadrispherical plasma analyzer thus peers through a hole in the large dish-shaped antenna to detect particles of the solar wind originating from the sun. Looks like a funky little uh, hard drive. Square. The charged particle instrument uh, detects cosmic rays in the solar system. And uh, it almost looks like your uh, old-fashioned uh, Polaroid camera, which probably is where they model it after. Cosmic ray telescope. Uh, this collects data on the composition of the cosmic ray particles and their energy ranges. A Geiger tube telescope surveys the intensities, energy spectra, and angular distributions of electrons and protons along the spacecraft's path through the radiation belts of Jupiter. The trapped radiation detector uh, includes the unfocused Serenov counter that detects the light emitted in a particular direction as particles pass through it, recording electrons of energy 0.5 to 12 MeV, an electron scanner detector for electrons of energy 100 to 400 keV, and a minimum ionizing detector consisting of a solid state diode that measures minimum ionizing particles and protons in the range of 50 to 350 MeV. Uh, meteoroid detectors, 12 panels, a pressurized cell detector is mounted on the back of the main dish antenna would record penetrating impacts of small meteoroids. Uh, an asteroid meteoroid detector, uh, the meteoroid asteroid detector would look into space with four non-imaging telescopes to track particles ranging from close by bits of dust to distance large asteroids. Uh, ultraviolet photometer, ultraviolet light is sensed to determine the quantities of hydrogen and helium in space and on Jupiter. And they also have the imaging uh, photopolarimeter. The imaging experiment relies on the spin of the spacecraft to sweep the small telescope across the planet in narrow strips only 0.03 degrees wide, looking at the planet in red and blue light. These strips were then processed to build up the visual image of the planet. Uh, and an infrared radiometer. This provides information on the cloud temperature and the output of heat from Jupiter. Now, Pioneer 10 was launched on March 3rd, 1972. Uh, give you an idea, that is uh, older than I am. Uh, this was done by NASA on the uh, Space Launch Complex 36A in Florida aboard an Atlas Centaur rocket. The third stage of the expendable vehicle consisted of a solid fuel Star 37E stage developed specifically for the Pioneer missions. This stage provided about 15,000 pounds of thrust and spun up the spacecraft. The spacecraft had an initial spin rate of 30 revolutions per minute. 20 minutes following the launch, the vehicle's three booms were extended, which slowed the rotation to 4.8 uh, revolutions per minute. This rate was maintained throughout the voyage. The launch vehicle accelerated the probe for a net interval of 17 minutes, reaching a velocity of 32,114 miles per hour. Wow. That is cooking. Now, after the high-gain antenna was contacted, several of the instruments were activated for testing while the spacecraft was moving through the Earth's radiation belts. 90 minutes after launch, the spacecraft reached interplanetary space. Pioneer 10 passed by the moon in 11 hours and became the fastest human-made object at that time. Two days after launch, the scientific instruments were turned on, beginning with the Cosmic Ray Telescope, and after 10 days, all of the instruments were active. Now, during the first seven months of journey, the spacecraft made three course corrections. The onboard instruments underwent checkouts, and the photometers examining Jupiter and the zodiacal light and experiment packages being used to measure cosmic rays, medical, uh, magnetic fields, and other solar wind. The only anomaly during this interval was the failure of the Kanopona sensor, 
which instead required the spacecraft to maintain its orientation using the two sun sensors. Now, while passing through the interplanetary medium, Pioneer 10 became the first mission to detect interplanetary atoms of helium. It also observed high-energy ions of aluminum and sodium in the solar wind. The spacecraft recorded important heliophysics data in early of August 1972 by registering a solar shock wave when it was at the distance of 2.2 AU. Uh, this is 200 million miles away. Oh, just a small distance. Yeah, right, right across the street. Who wins? On, Ju on July 15, 1972, Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to enter the asteroid belt located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. The project planners expected a safe passage through the belt and the closest safe trajectory would take the spacecraft to any of the known asteroids was 8.8 .8 million kilometers, or 5.5 .5 million miles. One of the nearest approaches was the asteroid 307 Nike on December the 2nd, 1972. Now, the onboard experiments just demonstrated a deficiency of particles below a micrometeor in the belt as compared to the vicinity of the Earth. The density of dust particles between 10 and 100, did not vary significantly during the trip from the Earth to the outer edge of the belt. Only for particles of the diameter of 100 um to 1.0 millimeter did the density show an increase by a factor of 3 in the region of the belt. No fragments larger than a millimeter were observed in the belt, indicating that these were likely rare, certainly much less common than anticipated. As the spacecraft did not collide with any of the particles of substantial size, it passed safely through the belt, emerging on the other side about February 15, 1973. Now, as our happy probe goes on its encounters, on November 6, 1973, the Pioneer 10 spacecraft was at a distance right within the neighborhood, 16 million miles from Jupiter. Now, testing of the imaging system began, and the data was successfully received back at the Deep Space Network, a series of 16,000 commands were then uploaded to the spacecraft to control the flyby operations during the next 60 days. The orbit of the moon, Sunup, was crossed on November the 8th, and the bow shock of Jupiter's magnetosphere was reached on November 16th, as indicated by a drop of the velocity of the solar wind from 280 uh, miles per second to 225 miles per second or 140, I should say. Now, the magnapause was passed through a day later. The spacecraft instruments confirmed that the magnetic field of Jupiter was inverted compared to that of Earth. By the 29th, the orbits of all the outermost moons had been passed, and the spacecraft was operating flawlessly. Now, red and blue pictures of Jupiter were being generated by the imaging cameras, and the rotation of the spacecraft carried the instrument's field of view past the planet. These red and blue colors were combined to produce a synthetic green image, allowing a three-color combination to produce the rendered image. On November the 26th, a total of 12 such images was received back on Earth. By December the 2nd, the image quality exceeded the best images made from Earth. These were being displayed in real time back on Earth, and the Pioneer program would later receive an Emmy Award for the presentation to the media. The motion of the spacecraft produced geometric distortions that later had to be corrected by computer processing. During the encounter, a total of more than 500 images were transmitted. Oh, now, the trajectory of the spacecraft took it along a magnetic equator of Jupiter where the ion radiation was concentrated. Peak flux for this electron radiation was 10,000 times stronger than the maximum radiation around the Earth. Pioneer 10 passed through the inner radiation belts within 20R, receiving a general integrated dose of 200,000 rads. Cool beans. Wow, we're going to glow in the dark. Uh, from the electrons and 56,000 rads from the protons. Uh, in comparison, a whole body dose of 500 rads is fatal to humans. What? No. Not going to Jupiter anytime soon. Um, the level of radiation at Jupiter was 10 times more powerful than Pioneer's designers had predicted leaving the fears the probe would not survive. Starting on the 3rd of December, the radiation around Jupiter caused false commands to be generated, 
Most of these were corrected by contingency commands, but an image of Io and a few close-ups of Jupiter were lost. Similar false commands would be generated on the way out of the, out of, away from the planet. Nevertheless, Pioneer 10 did succeed in obtaining images of the moons Ganymede and Europa. The image of Ganymede showed low al albedo features in the center and near the south pole, while the north pole appeared brighter. Europa was too far away to obtain a detailed image, although some features were apparent. Now, the trajectory of Pioneer 10 was chosen to take it behind Io, allowing the refractive effect of the moon's atmosphere on the radio transmissions to be measured. This demonstrated that the ionosphere of the moon was about 430 miles above the surface on the day side, and the density ranged from 60,000 electrons per cubic centimeter on the day side to 9,000 electrons per cubic centimeter on the night face. An unexpected discovery that was to uh, the unexpected discovery that was Io was orbiting within a cloud of hydrogen that extended about 500,000 miles with a width and height of 250,000 miles. A smaller 68,000 mile cloud was believed to have been detected near Europa. That's some high up clouds. No. It wasn't until Pioneer 10 had cleared the asteroid belt that NASA selected a trajectory towards Jupiter, which included a slingshot effect that would send the spacecraft out of the system. Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to arrange such a maneuver, a model for future missions. Now, such an extended mission was not in the initial proposal, but was Why planned not? prior to launch. Yeah. Now, at its closest approach, the velocity of the spacecraft reached 82,000 miles per hour. Just, you know, kicking it. Now, and it came within 82,178 miles of the outer atmosphere of Jupiter, close-up images of the Great Red Spot and the Terminator were obtained. Communication with the spacecraft then ceased as it passed behind the planet. The radio oculation data allowed the temperature structure of the outer atmosphere to be measured, showing a temperature inversion between the altitudes with 10 to 100 millibar pressures. Temperatures at the 10 millibar level range from 133 to 113 below zero Celsius. And in Fahrenheit, that's about 207 to 171 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. While temperatures at the 100 millibar level were between 183 to 163 below zero Celsius Basically, yeah, freezing cold, no problem. Yeah, even 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 the even the penguins are going screw that. What? Uh, the spacecraft generated an infrared infrared map of the planet, which confirmed the idea that the planet radiated more heat than it received from the sun. Well, it's a long ways from the sun too. The crescent images of the planet were returned to Pioneer Ten as it moved away from the planet. As the spacecraft headed outward, it again passed the bow shock of Jupiter's magnetosphere. As this front consistently shifting in space because of the dynamic interaction with the solar wind, the vehicle crossed the bow shock a total of 17 times before it escaped completely. It's like the planet didn't want to let go. Now, Pioneer 10 crossed the orbit of Saturn in 1976 and the orbit of Uranus in 1979. On June 13th, 1983, the craft crossed the orbit of Neptune and so became the first human-made object to leave the proximity of the major planets of the solar system. The mission came to an official end March 31st, 1997, when it had reached a distance of 6.2 billion miles from the sun, though the spacecraft was still able to transmit coherent data after this date. After March 31, 1997, Pioneer's 10-week signal continued to be tracked by the Deep Space Network to aid in the training of flight controllers in the process of acquiring deep space radio signals. There was advanced concept study applying chaos theory to extract coherent data from the fading signal. Now, the last successful telemetry received from Pioneer 10 
was on April 27, 2002. Subsequent signals were barely strong enough to detect and provided no usable data. The final very weak signal from Pioneer 10 would be received on January 23, 2003, when it was 12 billion kilometers, or 7.5 billion miles from Earth. Wow, that's kind of impressive. Yeah. Further attempts to contact the spacecraft would be unsuccessful. A final attempt was made on the evening of March 4, 2006, and the last time the antenna would be correctly aligned with Earth. No response was received, and NASA decided that the RTG units had probably fallen below the power threshold needed to operate the transmitter. Hence, no further attempts to contact were made. But it was the first probe that we had that completely uh, left the solar system and uh, began an interstellar mission, and on it extended. Now, there were some uh, extra little neat things that were put out. The U.S. Post Office in 1975 issued a commemorative stamp for the space probe. Of course they did. Uh, in 1983, uh, April 25th, they crossed the orbit of Pluto, still defined as a planet at the time. Uh, interestingly enough, Pluto's irregular orbit meant it was actually closer to the sun than Neptune. Well, that's just weird. <laughs> and then, of course, it crossed the orbit of Neptune, the furthest planet at the time, to become the first human-made object to depart the solar system. Interestingly enough, there was a 1-800 number, uh, 1-900-410-4111. One could access a recording provided by TRW that was made by slowing down and converting Pioneer 10's data feed to analog sounds. Well, then, that's, that's interesting and weird. At the same time, yeah. And I'm sure somebody has done that. Probably and still plays with it. But, now, current status, as I had mentioned, uh, on July 18th to 2023, just last year, Voyager 2 overtook Pioneer 10, making Pioneer 10 the third furthest spacecraft from the sun... After Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, sunlight takes 18.7 hours to reach Pioneer 10. The brightness from the sun from the spacecraft is magnitude negative 16.1. Pioneer 10 is currently traveling in the direction of the constellation Taurus. Ooh. Now, if left undisturbed, and if the Klingons don't shoot it, <laughs> uh, Pioneer 10 and its sister craft, Pioneer 11, will join the two Voyager spacecraft and the New Horizons spacecraft in leaving the solar system to wander the interstellar medium. Now, Pioneer 10's trajectory is expected to take it in the general direction near the star of Aldebaran, currently located at a distance. I can see this happening. 68 like years. Now, if Aldebaran has zero relative velocity, it would require... More than 2 billion years for the spacecraft to reach it. Nothing. Now, well before that, in 90,000 years, Pioneer 10 would pass within 0.75 light years from the late K-type star HIP 117795. This is the closest stellar star flyby in the next few million years of all Pioneer Voyager, a New Horizons spacecraft, which are leaving the solar system. Now, a backup unit, Pioneer H, is currently on display in the Milestones of Flight Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum in D.C. Many elements of the mission provided to be critical in the planning of the Voyager program. Now, because it was strongly activated by Carl Sagan, Pioneer 10 and 11 both carry a 152 by 229 millimeter gold anodized aluminum plaque in case either spacecraft is found by intelligent life forms. Uh, the plaques feature uh, figures of the human male and female, along with several symbols that are designated to provide information about the origin of the spacecraft. The plaque is attached to the antenna support struts where it would be shielded by interstellar dust. Uh, the neat thing about it is not only does it show where Earth is in uh, proximity to the Sun, it also shows the course of where it passes the two planets and then escapes velocity. It also shows the size of the human in comparison to the dish that's on the Pioneer. Now, in, as I was mentioning earlier, in the film Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, a Klingon bird of prey destroys Pioneer 10 as target practice. 
Babu, space joke. Yeah. But again, on this uh, this date, it uh, became the first object to take and leave our solar system. So this is for Pioneer Ted, out there floating away freely. That's been the Bearded Bye. Historian. You folks, we'll see you next week. Bye. Space out.